it's Green Thursday, so a very magical date uh, when we meet. Also a very magical person, uh, Daig Auzinimelalx, who is the, uh, well, you are the chief in the sense of the NASDAQ Baltic and uh, a lot of experience in the markets, a lot of interesting publications on the future of markets as well as, you know, the, the European, uh, well, yeah, shared market and how it can uh, impact and really so h how sustainability comes into play of all this and and I think uh, for a polished financial professional uh, indeed your opinion is of value so uh, my perhaps the first question is maybe something that our, our listeners might be interested just to know quickly what the hell is going on in the markets right now uh, just like the, uh, in a sense, the volatility and, and perhaps what are the mechanisms, like the general mechanisms that influence the markets and to what extent people need to be afraid? Uh, I believe there is only one thing that is certain in today's uh, life and, and business. It is that things cannot, are not certain, you know. So s the only certainty is uncertainty. So I think uh, what's happening in the markets, we will we'll probably see and, and can uh, sort of judge uh, looking at it retrospectively. Yeah, But uh, we, we know that uh, after very fantastic years in market uh, during the COVID time, where uh, all the uh, equity investments were growing, we, we have seen decline uh, already uh, end of last year and beginning of this year. And of course, uh, war, uh, in Ukraine is a very important factor that adds to this uncertainty. Uh, therefore, of course, inv investors are concerned with what is happening. But uh, markets are cyclical. And I think, uh, actually, if you are investing in stocks, then given uh, that now markets have declined, the smart choice is not to sell your investments, but just do the opposite. Buy some investments that you believe in, uh, at very at more attractive price than you could have done, let's say last year. And uh, can you maybe comment uh, how did uh, COVID and then invasion in Ukraine uh, influenced uh, the stock markets? Uh, were there any trends that you noticed immediately? What happened? Perhaps spe spe specific sectors that. Uh, yeah. Might have been I, I, I think when, when COVID, uh, I believe, when, when COVID started, uh, we so, saw a very deep decline across markets, across all sectors and across all companies. And then when sort of uh, companies and investors adjusted to the situation, we saw that there was actually increase uh, in, in prices, mostly for, uh, let's say, uh, diff uh, companies who have very business to business sectors where there is very attractive uh, uh, who has uh, good digital marketing strategies, you know, and, and so on. You know, the companies, let's say Zoom and so on, who were able to adapt and offer products that were needed, you know, for businesses at that time. So I think the recovery from uh, COVID uh, was very quick. And actually for, for markets and for stock exchange operat operators such as ourselves as NASDAQ, for us, the main task was to keep markets open because uh, sort of in, in uh, open markets, you can see uh, sort of the fair price of shares and, and other financial instruments. And you see what is the market, market value, you know, and uh, it's important to have this secondary trading of uh, sort of uh, happening and interrupted so that all that want to sell can sell and those who want to buy can buy. You know, and for us as uh, market infrastructure, it was very important to stay, you know, open and available to our customers, and that's what happened. And uh, let's say another sort of thing uh, after this uh, markets recovered some, uh, of course, uh, businesses still needed capital for expansion, you know, and of course you come to market because you have growth strategy and you need additional capital to finance your growth. And there were also plenty of investors, also on retail side, private individuals, who had a lot of time to, uh, that they were spending at home, and they were uh, thinking about investing. And so, therefore, I think at the end of COVID, in general, markets are very uh, performing very well. 
companies were able to attract capital. There were investors who wanted to invest. And also sort of maybe one of the things uh, when a company wants to become public uh, is a lot of roadshows that companies do meeting investors, institutional investors and so on. And uh, given that uh, during the COVID the people couldn't travel, uh, there is a lot of online investor roadshows. And actually I think it saved a lot of time for uh, companies, you know, and also investors were able to get a lot of uh, information, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, make decisions about investment. Do you have talked about, well, of course, uh, an initial public offering requires public communication. And what you have said is that, uh, of course, p companies uh, attract, <coughs> they want to attract this uh, in these investments, these, these people, uh, these uh, also corporate investors. Uh, by you know virtue signaling uh, of today's uh, the, the values of, of being sustainable, uh, being uh, inclusive, uh, being uh, e equitable, and my question is uh, and the and in a sense so some say that this has some at, at first have been these just human values that existed without any virtue signaling and, and this really pushing of the of this narrative and my question is but. Would you say that nowadays it's only a virtue or is it really real change that, that investors seek uh, when they, you know, make uh, this kind of investment in these, uh, I don't know, big companies that today, the biggest ones? That yeah, I, I think it's sort of, it, it has changed, you know, uh, during the past couple of years, you know, uh, that uh, investors uh, become more demanding about sustainability, about, uh, you know, different uh, environment, uh, you know, governmental, social uh, policies that companies have. And they are able to be more aware of it because of development also of social media, you know. Uh, and uh, companies are becoming more and more aware that they have to not only think about uh, what shareholders want, you know, or founders want, but also think more about stakeholder uh, relations, you know, how they community, how they communicate with broader public, and that that is a trend. And I, I now also what we see already now, let's say for bond market, if we speak about uh, Baltics, for example, the majority of issues, at least large issues, are gr green bonds. Yeah, so investors are looking for this green investment, especially institutional investors, and I think, uh, no, sort of, yeah, the majority of those uh, bond issues are green, and that's what what is in in demand. Mm. Then also, of course, companies are publishing uh, not only annual reports and corporate governance reports, but also sustainability reports, mm. and uh, that is a no sort of a way how companies can tell about their practices and what they are doing and, and so on. So this is uh, more and more, you know, you see that this is what companies do. And also we see that, uh, let's say, in Latvia we recently adopted a corporate governance code which applies not only to listed companies, but it applies also to state-owned enterprises and other uh, companies with big uh, influence on economy. and. Uh, uh, I believe starting this year, companies will also publish this corporate, all companies will publish also this corporate governance uh, report and also this ESG report. So. Um, I wanted to know, um, of course it is very important to address sustainability and mm. green type of living, but would you say it is a trend that is for a specific amount of time? Uh, or it will end eventually. Of course, you know, there are the plans of uh, various companies, what they're going to do in the next 10 years till 2030, how to uh, apply various kinds of um, different kind of thinking also regarding uh, their um, workers and emplo uh, em employees. But is it to stay uh, for a longer period of time or it's just right now to use as a tool for marketing and because it's necessary or a must to do so? I think it's a trend to stay, yeah. Uh, but of course it will, uh, you know, sort of there will be changes, you know. And I think uh, to avoid that uh, sort of it's just for reporting purposes, you know, 
we will go more in depth, you know, sort of what is reported, how it is reported, is it actually reported truthfully, yeah? Are those the things that need to be reported on for particular business, yeah? I think it used to be so, like a couple of years ago, that every company was saying that they are, um, uh, you know, socially responsible, you know, this like sort of, and then many companies were saying that, uh, or saying that they are uh, socially responsible because they, they do some sponsoring, yeah? and in return they get, let's say, tax uh, benefits or things like that. And I think it's a little bit uh, superficial, you know, to think that way. Or also, like, um, you know, a couple of years ago there was uh, changes in law, taxation law, how this, uh, no sort of those um, donations were treated from tax perspective. And there, this very favorable regime was uh, sort of replaced by something less favorable. And then uh, a lot of uh, sort of, uh, uh, no, different uh, NGOs were saying that due to this change, companies are not sponsoring, etc. And I, I think actually it's a very, very strange argument because I think you need to uh, sponsor or support a particular event because you believe in it, that it is the right thing to do, you know. <clears throat> and because you want to make a difference and you want to contribute to making this difference. And the reason cannot be getting tax benefit. Yeah. So, so I think in, in general, I think it's a trend to stay and it will grow in, in depth. And also I think investor community will become more, uh, you know, educated on the topic, you know, and uh, businesses will have to report in substance on things that are matters to them, not just something that they can get a better score, let's say. I like how you said, what is the right thing to do? What gives you know this additional benefit and at least in my experience what I have seen how people talk about uh, markets around me and just in the news also financial news in many situations it sounds that this kind of interest in the markets is secondary it's not about the added value but it's about what others think the value is and so how do you see this the representation of the value and, and the incentive why people uh, invest to what okay. extent are they interested in yeah yeah i no, i mean uh, you know i i think sort of well, what is uh, what is stock exchange and what's capital markets yes, yeah that's, that's sort of yeah. stock exchange is an infrastructure yeah on one side you have companies who want to grow and need need additional capital on the other side you see private individuals and institutions who have money and want to turn this money just from being in deposits, they want to turn this money into productive investment. And, and stock exchange is sort of a place that makes this capitalism in which we all live work for all. Yeah? You can be an entrepreneur, you can own a company, you attract additional capital from public, and then also this public becomes investors and co-owners in a company, and this is how everybody can benefit from capitalism. Yeah? And of course, <coughs> you as investor, you have basically only one thing in mind, why you invest. You want to make money. And uh, of course, now investors are more demanding because they uh, not just want to make any money, they want to make uh, sort of this, uh, let's say, green money or, <laughs> or you know, this uh, ESG conscious uh, money, etc., etc., you know. And what companies do from their side, they basically, the moment when they do IPO, attract capital, they start managing other people's money. Yeah? And at that point, corporate governance becomes very important because you have to ensure that uh, one vote is, uh, one share is one vote and one dividend. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And of course, you as investor, you invest in business. And business is associated with risk. And you, it's an equity investment, therefore, if the investment is successful, you become richer. If investment fails, then of course you lose that money. But what, you, what is important for you as investor, uh, when you understand all the risk, so that nobody steals that money from you. Yeah? It has to be, like I said, one share, one vote, one dividend. Yeah? Uh, yeah. So 
therefore this uh, corporate governance and on all those activities corporate governance and also ESG reporting and etc 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 and when you as investors say okay I don't like this company anymore or I want to invest someplace else I go to stock market and via secondary trading I sell the shares yeah and what company gets if company is public, they, a company can attract capital not only one time, but also second time and third time and fourth and so on and so on. Uh, the moment the company attracts capital uh, on, on stock exchange, it's again, company becomes more transparent and, and so on, more, uh, more, uh, uh, more competitive and, and so on. And then also bank lending and all other options for the company is available. Yeah? Company founders what they gain they get this market value yeah when the company is uh, on a traded on stock exchange there is market value uh, that you know every day because uh, investors uh, keep buying and selling shares and as a, as a result there is this market price and you, if you multiply let's say a, a price for one share with uh, you know shares outstanding you get this market value yeah Company owners, again, they get liquidity, meaning that if some, somebody from founders wants to exit, etc., etc., they can do it via stock market, yeah, in a transparent way, and they can sell their stake for, or reduce their stake for, for this uh, market, uh, market price. Mm -hmm. You had a question? Oh, no. My question was, um, well, okay, the Baltic market it's basically just laid out on the table for you know gen gener generic consumers like the small capital investors also young people if they're interested would you say that but of course the returns are not comparable with what's happening in the west and uh, really well have you looked at the index oh, performance oh, <laughs> I, as i understand it <laughs> recently yes but uh, the from the side of in my opinion, at least the supply side, there is not that much choice. What can be done, for example, in terms of diversifying in the Baltic market, as can be done, for example, in in, in you know Western markets. And would you say that uh, it's because of the lack of demand uh, of of you know investing and lack of demand in the in these uh, markets that they are so small still in Latvia? No, it's, I, you know, about this uh, abil uh, no, uh, possibility to diversify. Yeah? We have in Baltics, we have a regional capital market. What it means for you as investor? It means that you can, today, if you open a securities account and you think you want to buy some shares, you can buy shares from Estoni Estonian company shares, you can buy Latvian company shares, you can buy Lithuanian company shares. So you, you can geographically diversify. Yeah. Also, the industries that are represented, uh, sort of industries in which listed companies work, also, it can be anything from uh, green energy, you know, to, to different consumer goods and, and so on, yeah? So, uh, of course, I agree that uh, sort of maybe the ch choice is not, there are not that many companies listed today, yeah? But we have to look at our history sort of, of capital markets is about 30 years, uh, you know, long only. And I have to say that concept of, uh, you know, capital markets development go hand in hand with corporate governance and investor rights and etc. etc. And I have to say that the concept of corporate governance in Baltics is about uh, the sort of understanding knowledge or, or when the first time, uh, you know, uh, magic two words, uh, corporate governance were mentioned, it's about probably 10 years, you know, yeah. yeah? So we have, I mean, it takes time, yeah? And not any company can be listed and not any company should be listed. And in past, of course, we have had different companies and the majority owners sort of didn't know why they are on the market and they, maybe some of them still don't appreciate this fact that they are on the markets and they don't understand why I have to share, let's say, they think I have invested all the money in this company and I am the one who is uh, sort of uh, uh, represented on board or supervisory council and, and I am the one who is doing uh, sort of everything and why should I share it with 
minority investors, yeah. And no, of course, you cannot uh, change thinking of, of such people, you know. Only time, uh, with time, you know, you, you know, or with ownership change, it changes, yeah. But what we see now, I would say in the last five years, we have seen that really Baltic capital markets have boomed, yeah. Last year was an exceptional year for us. And now I don't have exact stats, but I think we had like about 10 equity listings and I don't know, 25 different bond listings, yeah. So you can, in Baltics, you can diversify geographically, industry-wise you can diversify, yeah. You can both uh, invest in stocks and you can also invest in bonds. Yeah? Well, as I understand, okay, bonds and securities, well, they, they, as I understand, they necessitate a larger sum of capital, you know, to invest. So is there any way how to make those maybe more? You mean it's not, no, like, for example, uh, like, uh, I think, uh, believe it was last week, we had, I don't know if you have noticed uh, on streets, those scooters, and there is Tool, sco scooter named Tool. Okay. And it's a, a I think it was tall. I, I think I have seen this. Yeah, exactly. So that it's a company that not only rents the scooters, scooters, but they also build the scooters. It's an Estonian company. So they recently attracted the bonds, three million, and they want to. And the the money is to expand in in Latvia their business. And the nominal value of uh, those b bonds were 500 euros, yeah, which is a uh, little bit less because usually it's around a thousand, you know, euros is uh, one, one bond, yeah, and it's nominal value. But it, it offers very attractive interest rate, 10%, you know, and there is a no, broad selection of different, uh, you know, bond issues and so on. But yeah, I agree, no sort of, I think 500 is the smallest uh, nominal that you can buy. It's yeah, just funny how I compare it with the, you know, minimum wage in Latvia and that it basically means for, you know, an average person it means just giving one, even before, even before taxes, like giving one month. Of the yeah, but I think, you know, but it's like if you receive a minimal wage, then pro and of course, if you're a student and you receive minimal wage and you live at your parents' house, <laughs> then of course you can uh, do investments, yeah? But if you are an adult who makes a minimal wage, then probably there is not much room for investment. And also probably you shouldn't. Because uh, the first of all, you should have some security, you know, some money for uh, no, like unexpected situations in life, etc., etc. Is, is it also like a measure uh, against volatility, would you say? Because, you know, smaller investors may be also more impulsive in their decisions. Yeah, no, uh, I think sort of... Uh, First, I think uh, smaller investors should invest long term, yeah, because long t in in long term there will be positive returns, yeah, because stock markets fluctuate, and therefore when we started the conversation, I said perhaps now when the markets are down, it's a good time to buy something that you feel at, no sort of that you think it's a good good investment or a good industry or good company and something. Now because you know. The theory is simple. You buy when the prices are low and sell when they're high. But when they will be low and when they will be high, and when, when is this lowest or highest point, you can only judge when you look at it retrospectively at the history. You that's, know. Yeah, that's why it's really important to average the cost. The average the cost of and I think also, sort of, yes, markets are down. But if you have c uh, carefully selected the shares in which you invest, and it doesn't, in, they are not, let's say, no, given today's context, yeah, they are not, their business is not neither in Ukraine, nor in Belarus, nor in Russia. And uh, I don't know, they produce cosmetics where, where uh, let's say, I don't know, e ecological cosmetics that are s sold across, you know, Europe. So why would you sort of sell the share? Because uh, sort of, I don't know, women will stop buying and... <laughs> I think, and, and this is what I was talking about, that people have this, you know, the secondary fear about an interest in markets, not about the real value and the, you know, how I value that company, for example, but it's about, okay, what others think how they value the company. No, 
Yes, but like, you know, when you invest, you invest for your own reasons. So write down your reasons why you have invested in that particular company, yeah. you know. And, and then again, you know, sort of, uh, would you like, on any other situation in your life, yeah. would you ask advice for those, uh, from those people, sort of, uh, why, why you think they would you value their yeah. advice on any other life situation? And if it's sort of, uh, you know, it's not the case, so why would you follow the crowd yeah. in, 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 in such, uh, you know, situation when your money is involved and everything? Because yeah? you don't believe your judgment is as good maybe as others. Because that you think, okay, maybe those people know better. And then you just rely on them, not to rely on yourself, and then you don't blame yourself afterwards if you are wrong. But, I mean, you still use yeah, you but your you know, money. But, but life is about experience, yeah? yeah? And it's, of course, in theory, it's good to learn from other people's mistakes. But in real life, I mean, it's very rarely when you sort of learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah, you mostly true. learn from your own, and especially if you're a, at young age, you know. No, I mean, who has made any mistakes, no? I mean, everybody. Do. So it's like, it's like, you know, and even if you, if you have invested, then sort of you have sold it at the wrong point, either too early or too late, no, it's education. Definitely. So next time you will be s smarter. But uh, as we all know, parents tend to protect us and taught us how to avoid those mistakes uh, from their experiences. But as you know, young people, we don't uh, tend to listen to yeah, the know. parents' advice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and question actually about financial literacy. Oh, sorry. Yeah, to what it, I think for many people, of course, these uh, financial well, financial knowledge is not something that you just you know share on you know. Uh, on a casual Friday night, uh, yeah. it's it's quite a, sometimes it can be a heavy subject for some people. So, my question is, how can we improve this financial literacy for people? Given the absolute, uh, well, absolutely, I think amazing fact that I think half of the population, at least in Latvia, don't have really savings; they live paycheck to paycheck. So, what's about that? What's about financial literacy? Yeah, financial literacy, of course, is a very serious sort of topic. And I honestly, I, from what I have observed, I actually think that younger generation, like my son, for example, is uh, 19 years old now. I haven't spoken to him about investment uh, or anything else, but uh, he has learned his, himself, you know, if the person is interested in, you can learn uh, yourself, you know, nowadays, you know, I mean, you can educate uh, yourself, you know. And I think young people are, uh, they may be, lack experience, yeah, like you said, you can make, you know, judgment uh, sort of errors. But in general, uh, I think have a good understanding, you know, sort of. And the fact that we are having this discussion, you know, it also testifies, you know, that. Uh, but I think the most problem is actually with uh, people who are like 30 plus, you know. I think because, uh, no, they, they haven't been taught in school about it you know, and uh, no, somehow haven't learned it, you know. Uh, it was just a no, different generation. But uh, sort of, uh, I, I think, let's, we, let's say, if we speak about Latvia and, and Baltics in general, I think we see a lot of also mm, different, like, NGOs, such as Financial Literacy Society, you know, where also NASDAQ is part of, where we educate, there are different seminars and et cetera, et cetera, where we educate people about investment and so on. There are very interesting uh, sort of, uh, uh, there is this Estonian uh, 20 years, no, maybe 30 years ago, there was this Estonian uh, d business daily, the journalists came together, they had some sum of money and they also started investing and it was, has been very successful and they have been telling in, uh, in their newspaper and, and, in, and on internet web page where they invest, why they invest, how successful they are, and so on and so on. And we see like that in Estonia, this equity culture has, has developed uh, faster, you know, sort of. Uh, in Latvia, now also this, uh, it, it was called Investor uh, Thomas in Estonia. Now in Latvia, they also, Aripayo has done the same venture. 
and they have investor Andres who is also investing in stocks and real estate and it's uh, everywhere, you know, and is uh, talking about it publicly. Yeah, so this is, uh, no, uh, and also I think, uh, no, how to develop this, I, I think this how to develop equity culture and why it is important is sort of, like you said, there are a lot of people who make uh, minimal wage and etc. and, and all sort of uh, don't think much about the future, you know. And I think it's in a, it's a way, in a way, uh, we have inherited it from Soviet time, yeah? Mm -hmm. This thinking that somebody will take care of me, you know, when I am old and so on and so on. But, uh, but the way how you can change it is sort of, you know, uh, there are some examples. For example, again, in Estonia, yeah, a couple of years ago, they listed the Tallinn port. Yeah? So basically, it's a government-owned uh, company, and they listed like about, I don't know, 20% or something like that on a stock exchange. And everybody in Estonia knows what is Tallinn port, what they are doing, etc., etc. And of course, also a company was doing a marketing campaign and so on, and at the end, there were like 15,000 investors, Estonians, who invested in Tallinn port, yeah? And you, uh, and I think also in equities, you learn by doing. And you do one investment, and you understand it's not complicated, you know, you, it's a well-known company, you know, sort of, you know that uh, the business probably, it's big company also, that the business will be sort of, you know, will be successful, you know, and this is how and now, in, in last fall, there was, a, again, in Estonia, uh, Enefit Green. It's a company, it's a green part of ST Energy, sort of uh, very, again, trendy investment, you know, and also in today's context. And uh, they attracted also like 75 million or something like that. And there were 60,000 Estonians who became shareholders in Enefit Green, yeah? And uh, this is why also, you know, like myself and we at uh, Nasdaq Riga uh, discuss and talk a lot, lot also with government that those state-owned companies that we have very many uh, also should be partially listed. Because by listing such big companies, you also help to develop this equity culture. And, and, uh, first, and there are many benefits. So it's equity, local equity culture. And then again, you, you invest and you start taking ownership of your future, yeah? of your life. Yeah? You start saving, you, you invest, you, you, know, you have some purpose. You know? And uh, so it, it takes time. But I said, no? But isn't, sorry, you wanted to say I, I wanted to ask if, our listener is a student, I don't know, first year, and uh, th this person wants to start to invest uh, and become an investor. Uh, of course, there is a lot of information on uh, internet to start with, but maybe you can give, I don't know, a, a tip? Okay, what is the amount of money that I need to, to start to invest uh, and uh, how to do it correctly? So maybe to invest in uh, various companies. Of, of course, it also depends on how much money you have to invest, but uh, what would be the start? No, I think first, yeah, you, so you have money. I think uh, the first you can open the securities account, which is very fairly easy, you know, in, in internet bank. And nowadays you can actually start with any sum of money because there are banks who don't take any uh, commissions, you know, neither for trading not for like keeping in securities account. So you carefully look at the, you know, banks, what are they offering, and you can actually start with any, any, any sum of money, and it will not be sort of, uh, no, sort of, you will not spend a lot of time on, uh, a lot of money on commissions, you know, and, and so on, paying bank fees. So, and I think in terms of what to uh, sort of choose, I think it's always good to look uh, sort of at what's available and what kind of business you like if you want, uh, you know, like I said, you can buy from different geographies, yeah, you can buy different industries, you sort of pick something buy that you, you like. Use also, <laughs> buy, you can buy, nowadays, you can buy what you use, you know, like we discussed the scooters or 
cosmetics or, or anything else. Okay, when did really, because of your experience already in the Riga stock market, uh, you have been there for a while and, and seen how this has developed, like all this equity culture already in Latvia. But, but maybe we can go even back, where, where even the passion started of, of these markets and of these subjects. Was it already to do, was it a general interest in economics or was it already something? Uh, For me personally? Yeah. No, I think uh, most things in life happen by accident. Mm -hmm. So like uh, like uh, you two also, you know, sort of you start uh, when you're young, you know, you finish your uh, whatever university or, or something, you start looking for a job and sometimes you end up in working in stock exchange, uh, sometimes in bank and sometimes someplace else. So for me it was, uh, you know, a stock exchange and I always liked sort of, uh, you know, I think uh, it is also, for me at least, it has been also important to do something that you see meaning why you do it. Uh, and I have, uh, initially, I was very lucky to work with uh, very passionate colleagues, you know, who were passionate about capital markets development. And, you know, it, uh, passion sometimes is contagious and you also mm -hmm. so get it. And I think it just, uh, I see that there is a role that stock exchange can play in, in economic development in Latvia and also in politics and also in the Baltic Nordic region, you know. And also if we look at the Europe, at whole, you know, at large, we see that actually capital markets in general are, I would say, underdeveloped. Yeah, because in Europe, it's a, mostly it's bank financed, financed economy. And if you look at US, then it's of course, you know, sort of capital markets financed. And the one way how you measure sort of this uh, development of capital markets is a market cap to GDP, this ratio. And if, let's say, in US it's like 200, and, and so, you know, then in, in, in Europe, on average, I think it's around 50%. Yeah? So you see that uh, there is a lot of room for development. And uh, maybe just few countries with exceptional results. It's the uh, United Kingdom. It is, I think, Swiss, and also Sweden, actually. Yeah, where this market cap to, to GDP exceeds 100% or you know, is, is close to that. And when you sort of look, for example, at Sweden, yeah, you see that it's a sort of you like this economic development there, you know. Their capital markets are booming, you know. There's a lot of great companies, you know, who are developing, exporting. It's in general a very wealthy nation. In a very uh, sort of very developed investment culture. I would say that in Sweden there is one of the most developed uh, investment or equity cultures across Europe, you know. Sort of that's something no, that you want to sort of follow, yeah. And, uh, and why sort of, uh, and this passion, I think it's, you see that there are many companies, you know. It used to be so that we, we have had always, you know, before 2008 crisis, you know, banks were loaning to any business uh, that now they would never loan, you know, and therefore there was this financial crisis and so on. After that, uh, banks became pickier, you know, about the clients. But again, for example, in Latvia, there have always have been very many banks. So if Swedish banks didn't give you a loan, then you could go to local banks and they would loan you money, yeah? Higher risk. Yeah, and, and you know, they would look like uh, at this corporate governance, like, no, through fingers, yeah, sort of, uh, wouldn't be so, how you say, uh, difficult to convince them to, to loan you money, you know. But uh, now the number of banks has reduced, you know, again, due to, you know, <coughs> many reasons and so on. And you see that there is now, like, a lot of businesses were found, like, let's say they are maybe, 5, 10, 20 years old, yeah, where the founders still want to be very active, you know. The, at this point, they probably are small or medium-sized businesses, yeah. But, but the founders, they want to uh, have visibility for their business. They need gross capital. And they are not afraid that there would be other smaller shareholders in the company. And they are ready to treat them like, you know, you would treat your family members, yeah. 
And you see that there is this uh, new generation of entrepreneurs growing. And for them, uh, capital markets and stock exchange is, a, for, uh, I would say, almost only option to develop. Yeah? And it used to be so that a capital, no, stock exchange was just for big companies, etc., etc. But now, during the last 10 years, we have seen trend that there are smaller alternative markets open and the smaller companies can come and attract capital. Like, for example, one of the success stories, if we speak about Latvia, is Mother Cosmetics. Yeah? And at the moment they started, their, I think their turnover was around 6 million euro, which is not a big profit, I think, was around uh, 1 million. And, and now it's like, I don't know, recently it was like 16 million turnover and profit like 3 million or something. But the market cap or market value of the company now is around 100 million. And when the company started four or five years ago on stock exchange, the market value was around 30 million euro. So a company has successfully developed. They have uh, different uh, good uh, products that uh, meet today's customers' demand, all this green and ESG and, you know, uh, this angle. They have very successful digital, digital marketing strategy, you know. And during the COVID, they just uh, expanded, you know, quite a lot. And, and you see, and the business like that, you no, know, it's... It's uh, very exciting to, to you know, to, <laughs> to help such businesses grow. And for them, this uh, transparency, visibility that offer stock, stock exchange and also the fact that they, when they meet their clients, they can say we are NASDAQ listed company. It gives them a lot of credibility, credibility etc. That you wouldn't have any other way. Yeah? This NASDAQ listing is a sort of a, no, how you say, a quality Standard, mark. Yeah. yeah, and that's... For many of, like, the also that we men have mentioned already today, like different bond issuers and, and also equity issuers, small companies. And for them, it's very important. Are you investing yourself? I can't. I cannot invest oh, myself. Good question, actually. That's yeah, but sort of the one of the sort of I, I work for NASDAQ, and NASDAQ itself is a listed company. And every employee in NASDAQ is also a shareholder. So I own NASDAQ shares. And that's the only one you can own. In yeah, in, in a sense, yes. And also, sort of uh, speaking about sort of this uh, inclusive growth and inclusive development that we covered, like ESG and et cetera, uh, if company is listed, it can also issue stock options for employees. Because, uh, again, the companies that I named, like recent listings, uh, like, uh, I mean, Madara, Virshi, Delphin, et cetera, et cetera, they all have also stock options for employees. So basically, you can turn your employees also into company owners, shareholders. And that changes mindset of employees because uh, like also uh, mother owner, uh, one of mother owners was saying that sort of uh, uh, this, uh, you have employees uh, sort of, uh, you know, all hands like gathering and it used to be about like when we will have this and when we will have that and why we don't have Very that and yeah. uh, like sort of mm -hmm. no? and then after this uh, they introduced this uh, shareholder program the discussions became different how can we develop business how can we like save on on this resource or that resource etc and that's uh, like changes you know and and of course you know all the competition for top talent is, is uh, you know, is uh, very important, you know, to any business. And by having those stock options, you can actually attract people. Yeah, for, for first of all, you can uh, motivate them by result, result. So let's say we achieve this and this result in three years. You are still an employee in this company and you, you will receive, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 shares of the company. Yeah. And that's very motivational. And that is very unique to listed companies because uh, you have a market value. And if you are listed, sort of you receive your 100 shares, you see that the value on market, let's say, is 20 euros, yeah? And you can sell 
or you can hold it and let's say and hope that maybe in a couple of years it will be more, you know, and you can save that way. But if company is not listed, then you don't have this fair market value. You can order valuation of company, but it always can be subjective. And also there is no possibility for you to sell shares discreetly, yeah, on, uh, you know, on open market. You have to look for buyer, you have to go like, no, I mean, it's a, it's a hustle. Okay, maybe uh, a question about Europe, question about the European Union and the developments there. Uh, also, from my experience, I see, for example, the proposal for NIS2 directive, as well as the uh, DORA regulation proposal. Uh, they want to bring the financial market and, of course, the, and the financial technolo technology service providers really close together if it's a transboundary, for example. Uh, service so it is of course applicable to security measures and it's it's a critical you know infrastructure uh, from a European perspective uh, from European Union's perspective and my question is so would you say that any investment in capital well directives from the European Union also come uh, in light of str geostrategic importance you know maybe the events uh, happening in the last years have has made it more clear for European legislators that uh, well there should be more control more you know this focus on securing this that we have yeah no it's it's hard to to, to answer to, to that question but I think it's sort of it is uh, about uh, not only about critical infrastructure is also it's also about the data what's happening to data, you know, and uh, there is a lot of initiatives like the GDPR and so on, you know, that uh, how this uh, personal data and the company data needs to be, you know, uh, processed, processed and, and secured because as we see, you know, if you have data, you can manipulate, you know, sort of uh, outcome of, of different events, you know. So I think this is this importance, of course, uh, will just grow, you know. Yeah, it's about, it's about behavior a lot, I think, especially with, well, quite well-off Europeans that, you know, have this financial economic power and to a analyze that has, I think, a lot of, a lot of benefit for companies, perhaps that, that's why. We touched upon sustainability and uh, green thinking and uh, I also wanted to say that um, p part of a large part of uh, Western companies tend to uh, advertise. Okay, we have forty-five or fifty percent of uh, women, uh, so so to say that uh, women are more um, equal to many companies, and uh, we are open to them, which is which seems according to equality law very understandable and nice. But as we know, in the history, it has been different. So I wanted to ask you, is it also a part of a trend of, uh, or a tool of social uh, digital marketing? Okay, we have that amount of women and uh, we are open to them more. What is the deal with uh, this question too? Yeah, I think sort of... Um uh, it's, again, it's, it's uh, in my mind closely also connected to corporate governance, you know, because I think, let, let's say, if we speak about Baltics and Latvia, for businesses, uh, uh, I think the general understanding has been that corporate governance, it's like, it's something lawyers do, and it's a burden, it costs, you know, and etc., etc. Like a yearly project that you No, something, yeah. But it actually, it's not, yeah. The good governance adds value to the company because it, first of all, you 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 take a look what's your company supervisory board, what is the quality of management board, what are risk policies, how you treat employees, etc., etc. So this discussion about gender equality, etc., etc. Uh, I think I hope that it goes in depth because why this gender or other, any other diversity is important. It is important because if the boards are diverse, you can make better quality decisions, you can be more successful in business, and in the end, 
it means that you can make bigger profits, you know, and be more competitive, and so, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we, I mean, currently maybe it's a little bit of trend because it's not about counting uh, women or men or uh, someone else, yeah? It's about how we make this board structure diverse, you know, and different genders, different backgrounds, different business schools, different industries, different age groups need to be represented on boards. And then we can capture sort of all the experience and make better decisions, you know. And again, it's like uh, if uh, the board is sort of uh, compo composed of one type of people, you know, be it, I don't know, uh, all white females or, uh, you know, all black men or whatever else, we, we we cannot make good decisions because we don't know how the this opposite party thinks and feels about our product. Yeah, how how I mean, uh, you know, it has to be sort of if we want to make good decisions, we have to also board needs to reflect in a way society. Yeah, to for for whom you are working, you are selling your product. Yeah, a only company, then you yeah, can. A good company solves the problem and. In many situations, we can search for these problems around us. Yeah, exactly. Because you know, if you, if you, let's say, if we want to sell, if our, my company wants to sell something for, uh, you know, for for young people, I mean, uh, most likely I will never be successful. I need to have on board people from uh, the gen your generation, sort of, with your, uh, you know, to to think like you and and also understand what are the needs and how you, you know, sort of can. Can cater those needs. So what I hear from what you say is that, well, really, these ESG and well, corporate governance values are intrinsic for a successful company. We can make a paper or we can, you know, ignore it, but if these values are not there, they won't be profitable. But but it's you know, uh, again, if consumers are demanding that I don't uh, wrap. Uh, every pen in, you know, like this, you know, then the companies have to respond to that. So I think it's, first of all, it's about what consumers think, yeah? And as consumers become more demanding towards uh, what kind of paper it is, you know, uh, what kind of pen it is, is it, uh, are we able to recycle is it, it or etc. <laughs> is it uh, this and that and, and all those fancy sort of, um, you know, new words, then companies have to become that way. Because nowadays I think consumers, uh, consumers have a lot of power, you know, via social media, etc. It used to be, there was a saying, what is common between flies and banks, sort of, what's common? And the answer was, you can kill both with a newspaper. Meaning, that about fly it is clear, but about the bank, you can, sort of, bad publicity can basically, uh, you know, result in a bank run, and then, you know, you go out of the business. And nowadays, I think the newspapers, nobody reads anymore uh, paper versions or, you know, limited. But social media, in a way, plays as a similar role. So if somebody is irresponsible to towards, I don't know, environment or mistreats people, and we have multiple examples, yeah, Facebook and, and, and you know, and I mean, it's, I mean, Facebook is a listed company, yeah, et cetera, where also employees come forward and disclose something about practices, et cetera, et cetera. And that sort of reduces the value, attractiveness of the company in eyes of investors. And then it reduces also the market value, et cetera, you know. I think also in this digital age, it's so easy for us to vote, you know, this, the old principle of voting with your legs. So the same in also applies digitally. Uh, you don't like some kind of a service provider, just delete that app, just close yeah. that tab, right? But critical thinking is of a major importance. Sort of, you have to have this really you know, ability to think critically because not, again, you know, it's so easy to like and forward and spread and do whatever, you know, about things that maybe are not true, you know. So you really have to use your own head. Yeah, if all people would read the news when making investments, <laughs> would that be a good 
world, I think. <laughs> I think it would be a good world, world if uh, people would uh, think with their heads and sort of understand that them and only them are, is, are responsible for how successful future they will have and in what kind of environment and what kind of country they will live. This ownership of your life, I think, that is a sort of basis for any success, you know. If you're not happy about something, you can change pretty much almost anything nowadays. And also, at the same time, when you invest your time or money, you can always do it responsibly, right? You do it responsibly, you invest in things that you believe in, and it applies also to your time, yeah? Sort of, uh, you know, and I, I always think that it's not only important to sort of work and make money, you know, and, and, and provide for your family, but uh, I think it's also very important to make a difference in, in other activities, sort of what you do out, what you do with your life, time, money, you know, how you make a difference in, 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 uh, in a country where you live, you know, and I think uh, that's very important. So, and each one of us has something that we are more passionate about, you know. And for somebody, it's taking care of animals. For somebody, it's like uh, you know, this uh, Liela Talka, yeah, to cleaning around, yeah. For somebody, it's corporate governance. For somebody, it's uh, students' uh, podcasts, etc., etc. Yeah, that's we. I think we need to choose this also. This uh, you could say probably extracurricular activity where you invest your time and that's how you make your your life better because you do something that you really like and hopefully it matters also to other people you make their life better and you inspire them to do their thing and to add their value to the world so. exactly and and uh, you know because it's nobody else it's us we only us we can make uh, this is a great place to live and, and, you know, and develop business and so on. I think that this is a great end note to, to our interview. Very uplifting. Yeah, and maybe, except you have something you would like to add or maybe ask to us. But otherwise it was a very op eye-opening, eye so to say, about stock market and... Um, how we can start to li live on and work on our dreams. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.